we can still see their stylized portraits in stone. But what did they really look like? I asked Dr. Ali Osman of the University of Khartoum. Oh, they look like me, of course. I am a Nubian. Uh, um, very much the, the Nubians of today are the Nubians of yesterday. We, we got to understand that rather carefully because the Nubian culture actually have not yet been very much ex explored. The Nubians from within, I mean, I the Nubian, what I do and how I behave, wouldn't have changed that much from what the medieval Nubians ha have done. But the influence that were coming on us as Nubians, starting as early as you could say the Egyptian, and coming down to the Muslim and Arab influence, have been changing. That does not mean that the Nubian have changed. But this identity has had to survive many foreign incursions and even conquests. At one time, Meroe fell before the invading armies of Aksum, another ancient kingdom high in the mountains of what is now Ethiopia. In more recent times, the Turks and the British have sent in their armies of occupation. Most lasting of all has been the influence of Islam. But through all these changes, the Nubians have done more than retain their identity. Just as they absorbed influences from elsewhere, so they too have had a deep cultural impact on their neighbors. They build now as they've always built, in all probability just as the people of Meroe built, with an old effort-saving rhythm, constructing mud walls to defy the scorching heat of the Nubian summer. Their beds are no different from those of their ancient ancestors, like this one in Khartoum Museum with a pattern of headrest which is much the same here and right across Africa as those of 5,000 years ago. And the traditional clan marks cut into this Nubian's face can be seen exactly reproduced on a stone relief which decorates one of the pyramids just a couple of miles away. It's been said that Meroe was the Birmingham of ancient Africa. And that wasn't altogether a flight of fancy. For the people of Meroe had a very extensive iron-making industry. Just consider this enormous pile of industrial waste, of slag. It proves that among the major activities of the people of this flourishing city was to smelt iron. And here is a bit of the residue. A few yards away stood the greater temple of Ammon, Meroitic, although dedicated to a very Egyptian god. And somewhere in the sand, if I can find it, there's another remarkable fragment of inner African originality. Here it is, a stone inscribed with a fully operative script that was invented for the African language of Meroe in the 3rd or 2nd century BC. 23 signs for letters and a word divider. One of the earliest alphabetical ways of writing invented anywhere in the world and still a puzzle for modern scholarship. In wealthy houses surrounding the temple were found some of the comforts and enjoyments of Meroitic life. The style of these pots is uniquely Nubian and repeated nowhere else in the Nile Valley. Half a day's journey from Meroe by modern transport, a little further into the sand and rock of the Bhutana Desert, there stands another complex of stone buildings, this time dedicated to the gods of Kush and not to the gods of Egypt. Nowadays, this place is called Musawarat.
Strange hints remain among the ruins, like this old lion in the sand. But what were these buildings for? Perhaps the kings of ancient Kush strolled beneath these colonnades. Historians have offered this or that explanation. My own is that the principal function of this unexampled and partial building made it unique in the ancient world. This function, I think, was for the taming and training of the great African elephant. That seems to be the best explanation of the remarkable stone ramps which occur here, like this one, and that one over there, and another long one going over there. We can accept that the taming of the African elephant, bigger and more difficult to handle than its Indian cousin, had become a speciality of the Kushites of Meroe. With their skills, they converted this, the greatest of Africa's wild animals, into the military tank of the ancient world. When Hannibal of Carthage invaded Roman Italy across the Alps, he had 38 war elephants in his army. The skills of the elephant trainers of Musawarat may well have contributed to that legendary feat. These temple walls provide a surprising reminder of much greener times with abundant pastures for domestic grazing. All that has vanished. As the desert advanced from the Sahara, the civilization of Meroe disappeared. Today, away from the banks of the Nile, only nomads can survive. This well has never been known to run dry. The scene is exactly as it was when I first came here some 30 years ago, and I doubt if it's changed very much in a thousand years. Proud and self-sufficient, these people seem untouched by the modern world. It's rare to see a single mass-produced item among their belongings, or anything made of plastic. It's as if they share a determination to rely on nothing but themselves and their animals. Visiting Europeans have usually made the mistake of judging the degree of civilization among different peoples by the number of their possessions. The ancient traditions of these nomads reach back to the very beginnings of history. And should they still remember their ancient gods, those too are still here, not yet swallowed up by the encroaching sand. Here at Naga, there's an even more remarkable mixture of local and imported influences. King Natakamani triumphs over his prisoners in a very Egyptian style. The python, on the other hand, was an inner African religious symbol, regarded in many lands down to this day as a figure of spiritual power. And this representation of the lion god looks quite Indian with his three heads and four arms, but he too is uniquely Meroitic. The kingdom of Kush collapsed in the 4th century AD, but evidence has recently come to light that some of its people migrated across the plains of Kordofan towards the Nuba Hills. 